Welcome to Burning of the Midnight Damp, where we are dissecting music history, album by album, track by track. Today we are looking into the title track of David Bowie's very last album, Black Star, from 2016. Please remember to like and subscribe uh, if you'd like to hear other analyses of other songs from this album, and in the future, songs and album by other artists. If you'd like to hear the full analysis of the whole album and the other songs of this album, please subscribe to our podcast. And on top of that, if you'd like to hear the full podcast uh, alongside uh, listening to the, all the songs of this album together with us, please support us on Patreon. Links and subscriptions are below. My name is Froda. My name is Tron. And my name is Chris. And there we go. Hey ho. So, will we start from the very beginning? What is the first song that actually came out from this album? First song is the title track, but I thought we should start with uh, uh, the very first teaser of the song, which was uh, the opening credits for uh, the Last Panthers TV series, miniseries, that used a slightly different version of the song. And that was the first, actually the first release, you could say, of this song. And, and I think we should start there. On the day of execution Only women kneel and smile Love where that bass comes in. It's a wonderful version. That works brilliantly. It does. Yeah. It's mixed a bit different, yeah. And the builds and just cuts off um, and I remember well I, I don't remember actually but uh, I found out uh, I, I found uh, our uh, short exchange from a couple of years ago Frode, when this first came out uh, we wrote uh, on messenger and I found uh, that I, my first impression was that it sounded slightly like massive attack uh, around hundredth window with his sneaking uh, slow uh, whispered vocals um, heavy drums yeah, it, it, it's that kind of sound which I like so this is with a, <laughs> an appetizer that uh, we're very promising very it's yeah. the first time I heard this version so is it time for the actual track? Let's have a listen to the actual track. It's a lengthy one, almost 10 minutes long. So let's have a listen. doubling his own voice in there.
not quite the, the side if it is. I think it must be a treated vocals on the top. Some effect on the vocal. I don't think he's singing it. Or is he singing it? Well, almost sounds like a woman voice. In, on, the, on top of the other. Yeah. On, on top of his. That, that it does. I was thinking he had been uh, auto-tuning himself, but it's... I can't quite say. No, he so. could be singing it, but... Uh, Because no one else is credited with singing, right? No, I think it's only the only David Bowie singing. Yeah. yeah. I think this whole first part here, including this transition, is either first or second take. Just. Yeah. yeah? Also the vocal? No, the vocal was re-recorded, but... Uh... He played the vocal live with the band for all tracks, but they, uh, they were singing in different... Um, not different rooms, but stalls, or I don't know, so they could take out his vocal with no bleed into their tracks and uh, re-record the whole thing. I think only two, two tracks from the session retained their original vocals. Something happened on the day he died. The spirit rose and meet up and stepped aside. Very different Somebody atmosphere. Mm. Took his place and bravely cried. Sunny. I'm a black soul. I'm a black soul. It's almost like a I'm much more happy feeling, but those. I'm a black star lying there. They're a bit unnerving. Yeah. smooth transition into that uh, first part then. Yeah, extremely. And it's quite unexpected when you hear the first transition, how, how smooth this actually is. Yeah. And the first one is not actually that smooth in a way. It's not. It's more collapsing it. Uh... I love the rhythm in both, both sections, but 
know, it's, it's something with this hair. I like like that groove hair. It's a completely different rhythm than the. Uh, This is the one from the Last Panthers. I'm sorry that that ending is just like someone just put all this music into a machine that just goes into bleep blop mode and completely messes up everything. Is it the, is it, is is, the, is it the stylophone is playing at the end there? That's a good suggestion. It's it's possible. Let's see if it says stylophone on the credits that are very hard to read <laughs> if you can black read that black. that's impressive <laughs> is there a flute as well yeah there's flute yeah, yeah. McCaslin plays both flute and saxophone ah, okay. saxophone flute woodwind woodwind and uh, Jason Lindner piano Berlitzer organ keyboards And is there guitar? There is guitar, yeah. Who plays it? It, it doesn't say exactly which song is. Ben Monder played guitar. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, it says Erin Tonkin backing vocals on This Is a Pity. No, this is a. Yeah. Oh, no, wrong song. Wrong song, yeah. That's a pity. That's a pity. So the very first track on the album is actually the title track itself, Black Star. Um, it was released as a single a couple of months before the album, but that wasn't the first time we heard a snippet of the song because it was actually also used as a, as a theme song for a miniseries, uh, The Last Panthers, which also came out uh, that autumn. Uh, the single itself was released the 19th of November 2015. It was a full-length uh, track on the single. It was not no single edits. Well, it was kind of a single edit, actually, because uh, the original track was uh, a little bit over 11 minutes long, which would have been the longest boy track that he recorded. But uh, since iTunes have a limit of 10 minutes, maximum 10 minutes for their singles. They edited it down and it became 9 minutes and 57 seconds. So they used the same album track on, on the single. And the single was quite popular. It was a top 10 hit in Japan and Portugal. It reached uh, number 40 or top 40 in Belgium, Hungary, Italy and Switzerland. It reached uh, or peaked at number 61 on the UK single charts and uh, number 78 in the US on the Billboard Hot 100. 
And later it actually also won David Bowie uh, a Grammy Award for Best Rock Song and for Best Rock Performance at the 59th Grammy Awards. And uh, the song was accompanied by a brilliant and very interesting music video, also 10 minutes long, a 10 minute short film, directed by the Swedish director Johan Renk, who also directed The Last Panthers uh, miniseries. And also the Lazarus uh, video that came later. So Black Star is, is a complex song. It is structured in, in three different sections. You can say it consists of two different songs. Uh, the first one, which we might call the Villa of Ormond section, uh, is starting the whole, whole track. And then we have a, a I'm a Black Star part in the middle before it returns to the first part at the end of the track. The track was recorded during the last session that we had with his band uh, on the 20th of March of 2015. Most of the track was actually recorded in one track, one or two track. And uh, the guitarist of the song, uh, on the song, Ben Monder, has stated that it was, uh, or that much of the energy of the song comes from the fact that it was the first take, is the kind of urgency that the song has. And that means the whole song, like all the three different parts? It was uh, pieced together. It, it is at least two different takes that was was, uh, okay. was edited together later. And there was uh, also additional guitar work and strings and flute parts that was overdubbed later. Uh, McCaslin plays a flute solo in the song. And Bowie recorded his vocals uh, one or two months after the, the backing tracks were recorded in April and May at the uh, Human Studios. Although it was the last song that was uh, recorded for the album, it was the first song that was mixed. Uh, it was mixed by Tom Elmhurst at Electric Lady Studios. And it took him several days because it's such a long song. As with all the other songs on Black Star, except Dollar Days, um, Black Star was presented to the band in the form of a home demo made by Bowie that was quite similar to the end, but with a lot of embellishment from the band, like uh, he s had a part in the middle that it was just, here we make a shift from the first part into the second part, and they should just slowly disintegrate this dark opening into the more light the second part so that was well i don't know if you could call it an improvisation but uh, uh, that was made up in the studio to make that um, flow from part one into part two and i think the ending of course uh, sounds like it's improvised and probably is it probably is and it is a brilliant transition they do especially the first transition is 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 uh maybe a bit unstructured in a way. It sort of just collapses into different sounds and and, 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 uh, and then uh, each musician kind of play, plays their own thing. But I think particularly that transition between the second part back into the third part mm. is, is really, really well done. It's almost like you don't even notice that you are back in the first part again. It's all of just suddenly appears. It's, it's really, really well done, that, that last transition there, I think. And the end where it just breaks down, beeps and blips. Yeah, exactly. It would be interesting to hear the demos as well of those songs. We have, of course, one demo that we, we've heard from, from the, the album, which was uh, a B-side to one of the singles, uh, It's a Pity She Was a Whore. Um, but of Black Star, there is actually another version of Black Star as well. It, uh, it's, it's a shortened remix that was used in, uh, in the soundtrack for the film Moon is Daydream by Brett Morgan in 2022, which mainly spotlights Bowie's vocals and Jason Lindner's keyboards. So in a way, that's a third version of that song. Mm. There also exist a couple of cover versions, um, including one by uh, Jerry Bischoff and Amanda Palmer, together with Anna Calvi. 
Uh, it's probably the most prominent one of those. Yeah, there's also a cover version which is um, only strings, which makes sense because you can kind of hear that it's a very classical composition. It works as that as well as a rock song. And what about the music itself? What do you think about it? Well, the first time I heard it, it was in this uh, short uh, snippet, uh, the opening theme for The Last Panthers. And I immediately loved it because it was dark and slow and spooky electronic uh, Bowie, which is always to my liking. So I had high hopes to the uh, album uh, in the future. And when I first heard, heard, first heard the single, it was just amazing. Um, it delivered on the promise have to say and it uh, it's uh, his second longest song it, so it, it it was an epic with these uh, three parts and when the opening part uh, changed to the second part when you heard the first time it was you know you did not know what to expect but you you knew it was a 10 minute long song and uh, wow that, that was there was a moment well, what will he do and then uh, the Last Panthers um, excerpt is from the third part. Uh, so when it came back, you, you could hear it, but it's, it's of course very different. And um, I think it, it has Visconti doing overdubs for this jingle. So. Right. I mean, the, the track itself, maybe, maybe apart from the, the, the middle part, which is, yeah, I could say, slightly more conventional Bowie, uh, the main part of Black Star is, is it is a pretty unique track for Bowie. It's pretty unique musically. Um, in in a way, it's uh, like a, almost like a slow ballad, but it has a very busy rhythm over it. Mm. And and uh, the vocals, especially in the first verse, it's very chanting. It's almost like a Gregorian chant type. Uh, vocals that that he's singing over there there's a lot of uh, reverb and and sometimes the reverb is centered on certain words making them um, more underlined sort of and um, it's also uh, like a, a choir of bowies uh, like several voices put on top of each other harmonies i don't know it's not a harmony but it's a well, he's harmonizing with himself um, because there's no other, there's no one else singing the vocals in here, right? Except Bowie himself. No, no, it's only Bowie. On this track, it's only Bowie yeah. at least. Uh, there is, um, I think what maybe Chris is thinking about there, there's a very high pitched vocal tone there that I was curious when I was listening on it if, if, if he's actually singing it or if it is an effect. Uh, and and, I, and I, I'm thinking it must be an effect. I don't think boy reached that high at this at this <laughs> age. Well, I mean, today today ninety nine percent of the songs are made with auto tune, but I, I can't really think that that's the case in, with Bowie's music. But who knows? No, he sounds double tracked or triple tracked or something, but probably yeah. with some treatments that uh, give this uh, ghostly uh, Gregorian sound. And I'm I'm very with you, Chris, on this. It's um, from the get go. This is just a very thrilling song to listen to, and you get sunk sucked into this kind of deep black hole of music that is very ethereal, and you have this um, build up with the looping guitars and a droning mm. synth that comes in there. Um, and the first time I heard it, I um, because I listened to this the first time actually when it was released as the album. And really? Yes. I, I, for some reason, because I kind of, I don't know, I think I, I think I just wanted to wait until I could hear the, all the songs and it's eternity. Makes sense. Mm. Um, and then... I was completely sure that when you get into the second part, the one you refer to as 
I'm a Black Star, mm-hmm. um, that it was a different song. And as you say, the, when it goes back to the Omen part, it is so seamless mm. that it's, uh, it's quite incredible. Because you, you feel you're in a different song and then it just comes back and it just slides into it. Um, but then I was a bit like, is this the kind of thing he did with, uh, like, it, it's no game when you had like this reprise kind of song that he, because mm. there's two, uh, but there's two quite different versions again. He even did that much earlier back on Diamond Dogs with Sweet Thing, <laughs> Candidate, Sweet okay. Thing. Yeah, good point. Yeah. But, which is... At least on, on that album, tracked as, as uh, well, sometimes they're on the same track, but they're there, they at least have, have different titles. But but it is, it is very similar in a way, yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. And, and that transition, yeah, that is amazing. And to, to believe to, you know, to imagine that they did that in one or two takes as well, it's it's impressive. I can't imagine that they could have mixed that well, probably in some way, but but still, um. It sounds to me like they're 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 just playing that transition. Yeah, it does for me as well. Yeah. I, I I also have a hard time seeing it can be done any other way than that. And on the topic of uh, previous Bowie songs that we are reminded of, uh, "Station to Station" is of course the one that pops into mind because it's the longest, and uh, another one that's obviously constructed out of two. A very different parts, three different parts. If you have the 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 intro without the vocals, and um, there's also similarities to other uh, artists, of course, uh, and that might be, uh, as always, um, depending on the the ear who listens, uh, what type of associations one gets, but. My first association, uh, at least from the last Panthers, was Massive Attack uh, around 100th window. Uh, slow tracks with uh, ominous synths and uh, electronic beats and treated whispered like vocals with a lot of reverb. Especially the opening um, part of Black Star reminded me of that. And of course, Bowie did a, a track with. Um, Mass Attack around the time, uh, Nature Boy on the soundtrack of uh, Moulin Rouge, uh, who is, which is a track I would say, you know, could go together with the Black Star. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I also, um, I find that this has a bit uh, similarities also with a couple of Radiohead songs. Mm. Uh, that has a lot to do with the type of experimentation that he does is also something that Radiohead does and um, especially the song Dollars and Cents this reminds me of and there is also this song by Julia Halter called Night Song that has the same kind of uh, almost this tar- type of dark mm. vibe to it yeah and Dollars and Cents has this Miles Davis jazz type feel um, so we are, we're in the rock, jazz, fusion landscape uh, here. Definitely, yes. Yeah, comparison makes sense. No, it is definitely um, mysterious, to me quite creepy song, which, which I really like. And, and of course, the music video also really emphasizes the creepy side of, of, uh, of the track. You want to tell us a little bit about the video? Me, <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah. The video is together with um, Lazarus featuring uh, one character, uh, which is a person with bandages and buttons for eyes, like in the book Coraline by uh, Neil Gaiman. And um, this character is uh, called the somnambulist uh, in Boys notes which is um the sleepwalker but more specifically the sleep sleepwalker in um, the cabinet of dr caligari so it, it makes sense that the city we see in the movie 
you know the movie not in in the video for Black Star it looks like silent a silent movie set uh, it could be the set of Dr Caligari and that is of course something he has um, been coming back to all through his career there's a lot of uh, stage sets or video backgrounds that looks like silent movie and of course his background in pam- pantomime uh, could also be uh, a part there but um, that's one of the character and the other character is this looks like a, a priest um, waving some sort of a bible looking book with a star on it um, cross between uh, a preacher and a, a red army uh, uh, official in China or something and he never sings um, but um, the one who does a lot of singing is the third uh, which is this uh, I don't know what you could call it it looks like an old uh, show showbiz man some sort of trickster with a um, devilish grin who sings the happy uh, but slightly scary middle part the I'm black star part um, and uh, the, the bow, Bowie in the video he, he uh, it cuts between these three images and um, in the Lazarus video we also get the somnambulist with the buttons uh, but you also get um, grinning um, Bowie could be the same person who sings this middle part yeah I'm thinking the same yeah, yeah. so that, that's the the video of course they, they're made by the same the director and they're made from Bowie's uh, notes uh, he told and uh, they share some imagery specifically this button uh, character um, which also is um, in, in a photograph in uh in the brooklet for the album the video also has a lot of uh, disquieting imagery there's uh, people uh, scarecrows crucified three scarecrows three cr- yeah kind of shaking in a, in a strange way and, and uh, do you know what inspiration for that was tell us it's quite f- Quite quite funny actually. It, it, uh, Bowie particularly wanted them, wanted it like that. He, he instructed uh, Rank to put that in there, and his inspiration was classic Popeye cartoons, old Popeye cartoons. If you see the background mm. figures there, they're shaking because they're Bo- reusing the same animated cells again and again. Yeah, Bowie, Bowie wanted <laughs> that effect in, in in this video. I find that a bit cool. Yeah. Did yeah. he ever say why? I don't know. It's a cool idea, and it, and it looks creepy. E- even in those old old cartoons, I find it a bit creepy, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, yeah there's uh, shaking in the beginning, and uh, in the end, there are women standing in circles, uh, shaking. But in the in the beginning, it's uh, I think three persons or so in the background of Bowie inside this um, this house, and uh, and the third part is also in this looks like a loft uh, with a triangle uh, roof. Something he also had in the look back in anger video. But the shaking you're you're telling Bowie's um, inspiration but my first association when I saw it was um, um, the right of spring um, Igor Stravinsky the the ballet ballet which tells the story of a, a Russian uh, village um, and there's a um, it's not a plague but it's a some years of bad bad harvests and they do a sacrifice and uh, um, it, it ends with uh, the, the chosen one, the, the young uh, female of the village who dances herself to death uh, inside a circle where they all stand shaking just like they do in the, in the end of this uh, video. So that was my first association. 
how here is uh, making a nod to the Rite of Spring. And uh, of course, there's a lot of other elements in the video that um, not connected with the Rite of Spring, but but rites in some sort of way. You know, there's the this uh, enormous candle. Uh, well, it, 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 it's a candle with. Um, that has been burning for a long time, so there's a lot of uh, in in the bottom, um, and of course there's parts of the lyrics that put this in the um, sort of slightly occult. Uh, and Absolutely, and 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 uh, there are a couple of other uh, odd characters as well, well in the video. There's a woman with a tail. For example, mm. um, Bowie didn't offer any explanation for it, except that he said it was kind of sexual. And there's also this uh, dead spaceman. Of course, we cannot forget the dead spaceman in the beginning, the astronaut. And, and uh, for anyone who has been following Bowie for a long time, that of course. Uh, Brings us to to Major Tom. I think it's it's pretty clear that that astronaut is Major Tom. I think at least for for most Bowie fans, it is. <laughs> Maybe it isn't, but but uh, for mo, mo, for me, it is at least. Yeah, we we can never know what he meant, but he must have known that putting a skeleton of a spaceman inside a spacesuit in this last video with a, a jewel encrusted uh, skull that becomes part of a ritual in the end with the shaking that people would say that the, now this is a, some sort of sacrifice of Major Tom in the end. And a, a little fun fact, um, Bowie's son, Duncan Jones, is a movie director and he made a, a movie called Moon. And um, there's a button on the spaceman suit which is from that movie. Oh, that is an amazing detail. <laughs> <laughs> and that would actually be the fourth time that uh, Major Tom is mentioned in a Bowie context. Mm. Or, or not mentioned, but... but uh, Implied. Implied. Uh, mm. He's also in the, the musical of Lazarus. Yeah. And uh, the video ends with this silly-looking monster uh, popping out into the field with the scarecrows. And that makes the video... You know, the, the video has some strong images, some disquieting images, but it also has some you know, pretty silly images, like this uh, 80s children's television-looking... <laughs> monster coming in the end so uh, and all this is, this is true to Bowie uh, there's always uh, some eye winking in there somewhere uh, don't take it too serious and I think um, I read somewhere John Rank saying that even in this uh, the very dark Lazarus video I'm jumping to a different song but even there Bowie sort of tried to put in little jokes and little comedy because that is the British thing, uh, the guilt of being serious, you cannot be too serious, so he, he made it a little silly on purpose, which also made it uh, not as hard to watch but, but more uh, humane mm. he said something but that was from memory, so it's not <laughs> exactly that he said but yeah I can mention last on the video it, it in the end one um an MTV Video Music Awards for uh, Best Art Direction in 2016. Mm. Well deserved. Well deserved. Absolutely. Uh, let me say just one more thing. This village that you see, uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, the, that's only one associ association. Another one is, um, cannot remember the, the name from the labyrinth, uh, the Goblin City. Reminds me also of the Goblin City. If it's, don't know if it's on purpose. <laughs> Wouldn't be Never surprised know. if it does. 
So from uh, Goblin City and over to uh, have a look at the lyrics for the song, which is of, of course also very mysterious and obscure. Um, but we can we can start from the very beginning with the, with the title of the song and the title of the whole album, Black Star, and and uh, there is a um, some inter- some interesting connections there between what a black star is and, and, and what maybe Bowie was in, intending. Of course, we don't know what Bowie was intending why he called it a black star, but one point that I find particularly interesting is that in astronomy, a black star is a transitional phase between a collapsing star and a singularity. Uh, and a singularity is a point where, where uh, normal rules of space and time no longer exist. Um, so it kind of implies here if Bowie is the black star, which he of course mentions many times. I am a black star. In the song. He's not uh, not a film star or a pop star or a Marvel star. He's a black star, his own unique entity. And if, if you take that astronomy interpretation of it, with him being the black star, being in the transitional phase between a collapsing star, and singularity, which of course in this context would be death. I like that uh, mm. possible uh, interpretation. Whether or not Bowie th- knew about that or thought about that is another question, of course. But it fits very well, with at least, with knowing where he was at the time. Uh, although he didn't have, when he re- recorded the song and wrote the lyrics and, and made up the title, of course, he didn't know at the time that his cancer was terminal. That was a message he got first in November that year. But still, the whole album is filled with uh, thematic on on, on, uh, mortality and uh, and that aspect of it. So it it certainly was on his his mind. With him having cancer, he probably had that in his thought. Sometimes you think of all these late Bowie albums heathen and reality and next day and black star that they all they could all be sort of farewell albums they're made with with a a last song that could be this could be the last words so we can never know what he thought but um he sure surely made sure that this is an album that could be um interpreted as his last words if that was how it was to play out and it, it, it was there are a couple of interesting um, coincidences around uh, the song black star or, or, or the title black star because it's not the first it's not the first song that was called black star um, elvis presley released a song back in the day it's called flaming star which is, uh, I think, one of his best songs from his film years. And um, originally that was called Black Star. And, and it, it's yeah. still mentioned in the, in, in the lyrics, actually, which goes, when a man sees his Black Star, he knows his time has come. Which, of course, also has a mortality aspect to it. But um, it's probably stretching it a bit far that Bowie had that song in, 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 in mind. But it is a, it is a interesting uh, coincidence, at least. And another coincidence between uh, Bowie and Elvis, do you know what that is? No. They, they share a birthday? They share their birthday. Uh, yeah, the same birthday, 8th of January. And uh, which was, of course, also the release date of mm-hmm. the album. And uh, you, Chris, you also know what 8th of January 2016 is in another cultural context that's the inception date of uh, the replicant um, Roy Batty in uh, Blade Runner played by the brilliant Rutger Hauer and, and there's actually a connection between that also and Bowie because when, when uh, uh, Bowie's brother uh, Terry Burns died Bowie actually uh, quoted that famous last speech that uh, Rutger Hauer uh, improvised in Blade Runner. 
that uh, the part about uh, all those moments will be lost in time like tears and rain. And there's one one more connection there because uh, the David Bowie is exhibition when that uh, toured because it, it was in, in the, the Victoria and Albert Museum in, um, in London first and then it, it, it toured the world and when it was in, the, in Brooklyn they also had an, a, a little edition with uh, Bowie's notes for the videos and the songs for Black Star and there were some unused lyrics for Black Star with I'm uh, I'm a various types of stars that was not used um, and one of them was I'm a blade star right mm-hmm. but the connection to to Elvis um, his album was released on his birthday but it was not intended so that was because the video production took longer than planned so it was a supposed to come out in the autumn so November, December but it was pushed fo- uh, forward yeah should we have a listen to Elvis Presley a short clip yes I'd love to have that every man has a black star a black star over his shoulder And when a man sees his black star He knows his time, his time has come ah. Brilliant. Did he know his time was had come? Not at that time. <laughs> There's actually another odd cultural connection here between Black Star and the and, uh, TV series that Bowie was a big fan of, Peaky Blinders. And he actually sent the Black Star album to the show's creator, uh, Stephen Knight, and uh, requested that his music would be used in the third season of the, of the show. I don't think it was. I think the song Lazarus It was. was used, yeah. Okay. And uh, the star of the show, Killian Murphy... And uh, Bowie, they exchanged gifts and became friends. Uh, And and Murphy's character in the show, he references a black star in one of the in one of the episodes. Yeah, it's a sort of operation. It's a code name for a day when they take out their opponents, drawing a black star in his note and calling it. The Black Star Day. Yeah. Brilliant series. Should we have a quick look? Yep. There's tea. A new system. Everything in the diary, eh? Mm-hmm. Black Star, what does that mean? Black Star Day is the day we take out Billy Kimber and his men. No. Yes, it's the day we take out Billy Kimber and his men. Hmm. It's not what boy meant, but okay, no. Um... Yeah, so the lyrics, a uh, lot of um, odd imagery, and, and very early on, the uh, first uh, line he mentions uh, the villa of Ormen. Originally, it was the villa of all men. Yeah, that can be seen in these uh, um, notes that were in the David Bowie his exhibition. And if it, w- if it was the villa of all men, it would be a logical continuation when he's only woman kneel which comes later so you got the yeah, the mm. villa only women kneel in the villa of all men but uh, he changed it to Orman yeah. whatever that means for us 
Norwegians that has a very specific meaning. Uh, basically, being a snake or the snake or the serpent. Yeah, one 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 serpent is Orm, and the serpent is Ormen. Yeah, and uh, it, it is in both uh, Scandinavian languages and, and, and Norse languages as well. And uh, of course, the image of serpent, especially in, in Norse mythology or several mythologies for that matter, where he bites himself in the in the tail. Uh, representing the cyclical nature of of uh, life and death and and rebirth and it's uh, you know coming at the stage of uh, at this stage of in Bo's career and life it's also interesting to think about uh, Black Star or, or that Allman in this uh, sense sort of uh, uh, reflecting on the idea of that uh, while life ends some essence of or, or legacy continues it in memory or, or in this context, in, in, in the form of art and music. Mm. The words also resembles a line from Alistair Crowley's 1913 magic ritual, the Star Sapphire, which he states, let him then return to the center and so to the center of all. And that is uh, something Bowie uh, mentions a couple of times here in the in the text, the solitary candle, and uh, in the center of it all, in the center of it all, your eyes. And that's not the first time he mentioned or referenced Crowley in his work. We have to mention Station to Station again, of course, but also Quicksand and others. It's in fact also not the first time he mentions in the center of it all, because in the song Slow Burn from Heathen, he sings, and here we are at the center of it all, slow burn. Have you given any thoughts to the lyrics, Tom? Apart from what has already been mentioned, it's um, it's hard to not look into the song as kind of a requiem from Bowie. Um, and it's almost like you wish to go back to the two days or like the days before when he was still alive and you can listen to this again because at least you just had the implication, you know, that, um, okay, because Bowie had been through such a huge career and it covers so much more ground than uh, what, you know, almost 100 single artists would do during their own lifetime. Um, and to have this as almost like a final statement is uh, quite remarkable. But it also goes with the myth of Bowie, which just continues with uh, with this work. Yeah, I think if he had made interviews in his last, uh, last years, it would have taken away some of the mystery, because now he has... Uh, two albums with a lot of um, lyrics that you, in a, one way you can interpret them to be about himself or, or his his legacy, his career, his uh, illness. But it can also be very specific about other subjects. Um, as we know, books he read and, and so on. Um, so you can you can interpret them either way, and I, I think this vagueness um, is likely intended, um, and without providing us for um, a correct answer, he gave us the the possibility of having these speculations. If he said that this is a song about so and so, then we wouldn't have all these various theories uh, to to make the song last because we continue to come back to the mystery if the mystery is solved then it's not as not as fun and McCaslin said something in, in one of the interviews that Bowie had told him that this song is about the rise of Isis uh, and that sounds weirdly specific to be Bowie he very rarely uh, did that um but of course, anything is possible, and uh, it could be 
Well, official spokesperson for Bowie has since denied that there is any relation between the song and uh, and and the Middle East situation. Yeah. So and listening to, I mean, it does have that sort of Middle Eastern tone in here and there, maybe, but uh, apart from that, it, it's hard to see the connection. It would be the the day of execution and the kneeling and I don't know. It it, it gives some imagery uh, of um, fundamental religious um, groups, of course. But um, it could be things he just threw out in the studio to give them um, associations to work with while they played like um, he did on the outside giving them um, notes and directions uh, McCaslin said something that Bowie uh, never said play this and this and that in a standard musical way but he also always spoke in sort of metaphors and, and uh, imagine this is a song about ISIS Yes, play like that. Uh, th- that sounds more like Bowie. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, play that's like, yeah. yeah. Mm. But we can never know. Can never and know. that's the beauty of it. Certainly a song that resonates, that's for sure. Yeah, and with that, I think we end it for, for, for today. Um, thank you to everyone who was watching us on, on our YouTube channel. Remember to like and subscribe. And uh, yeah next episode will be on the next track on Blackstar.